and greetings, welcome. I am here to say that I have evidence right here in the palm of my hand. I have the evidence that I have emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And this cover of this book, it's so perfect. Why it can matter more than IQ. So the other angle on this, uh, 10 years later, an updated approach is the social intelligence. These are Daniel Goleman's books, two of his books, and are the basis of what I've been asked to present today, emotional intelligence. And they call social intelligence the revolutionary new science of human relationships. It's amazing that it's taken us this long, but it's like one of those things, like how long did we have those separate little wheelie carts to carry our luggage before we just put the wheels right on the luggage themselves? It's one of those things that, duh, like a, a head smack in the head. Why didn't we think of this ages ago? So people in the group have asked me for uh, more personal stories and uh, to share my own journey and how these pieces of information relate. And so I, I just have to come clean on this one and say that probably the most frustrating thing in my entire life as I go through life and what I experience, one of the very, very, if not the absolute pinnacle, maybe with no competition, most frustrating thing is the lack of emotional intelligence in those around me and my own inability to crack through those egos, to get to that proverbial voice of reason inside. So here's a metaphor that I came up with. And I've, I've said this about driving before, it was kind of a, a thing I already had, but I'm gonna use it to relate to emotional intelligence and, and our socialization. <laughs> if you're driving on the freeway, we're by ourselves. I'm in my car. I'm the only car on this road. It's a fried open freeway. There are walls on both sides. I don't need traffic laws. It doesn't matter if I signal or not. There's no one to communicate with. It doesn't matter if I speed. I'm not going to run into anyone or be, be unsafe to anyone. So traffic laws exist mm -hmm. because we have to engage and interact and work with one another. And so we need to say, you, stop. Light red, you stop. Okay, everyone else, come on, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'm holding these guys back, you won't get hit. We need that, right? And so we need one another. We are one of, if not the most social creature on earth. We're ultra social, we need one another. So we're not alone on a freeway. We need some traffic laws. If I lived alone in a cabin and I was a recluse or a hermit, I don't need social skills. If I sit alone in my room and I'm never gonna talk to anyone, what do I need social intelligence for? What do I need emotional intelligence for? Just sit, feel, do what you're gonna do, get your needs met and go through life. It only comes to life when we engage with one another. And that's why it's so important because all we do is engage with one another. No one person is an island. We live in societies where we need one another. Imagine you don't have anyone to go to to fix your plumbing or your electrical or to cut your hair or to make clothing for you or make your car work. We can't do it. All I could do without other people is walk everywhere I need to go, grow my own food, figure out a water source, keep my shelter over my head, or if I, God forbid, had to build a new one. I mean, I have no idea. How do you put together bamboo stalks and grass huts? I, I don't know. They did it on Gilligan's Island, but I don't personally feel that I currently possess those skills. So we need one another. And here's the cool thing about what Goldman is saying in this book he says about emotional intelligence, kind of blanket, this is the broad, broad sweeping strokes. It's a question of feedback, really, of people getting the information essential to keep their efforts on track. I'm gonna say that again, the feedback is people getting the information essential to keep their efforts on track. Feedback, is this working? Am I doing this right? Are we, are we on the right track here? Okay, and this is what Ron has been telling us all along. It's all about feedback. He calls it the backbone. It's the backbone of the work we do. That's the spine, that's the support structure that keeps it all together, feedback. 
So emotional intelligence and the con skills group and what we're learning with Ron are right, they work hand in hand. The thing about um, us as this 1400 cubic centimeter, super complex thinker with a very complex world around us. Someone made that guitar. Someone else made those strings. Someone else makes the pick I use to, to strum it. So it takes a lot of this working together and it's very complex. So the way that I put it in our, in life with everything we do, our intentions, what are we doing? Our intentions are complex. They're nuanced and perhaps most significantly, and this is why emotional intelligence is so important, our own intentions, what we're doing and why, anytime we speak, anytime we act, anytime we make a choice is concealed from us. How often do you think about why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I make that choice? We may do that once in a while. I, I would assert that it's likely quite superficial and we don't go very deep and really look at, wait, what was I actually doing? What was I actually getting at? So we are these emotional beings, right? We operate off emotion. Daniel Goleman says, just plain and simple, all emotions are in essence, impulses to act, okay? but yet our intentions are so complex and nuanced and we don't even know what they are. We get very confused by this. Emotional intelligence to me seems like one of the most important things we could possibly implant in our brain. And yet it's the most glaringly absent skill and knowledge that I personally witness. So the thing is, our fears, our negative emotions, they're totally valid, they're necessary. We need to know what to, be, uh, what to avoid in order to survive. Our prim start with primary motive in life, to survive. Next one, to propagate. And then we don't need to survive so much anymore. Once we pass in our DNA, we've done our biological duty on this planet and we can go die. As long as the next generation is taken care of and has a high likelihood of survival. That's the other thing, okay? But like every animal in this world, we need to know when to be afraid so we can avoid danger and survive. Now, if we have emotional intelligence, we keep our level of fear in balance and we aren't ruled by fear, which can ironically be an impediment to getting our needs met. So we're so desperate to get these needs met and then we do this crazy stuff and then we don't end up getting our needs met. Whoops, I needed to get there so fast, I drove so fast, I crashed and now I can't even get there at all. Welcome to, welcome to humanity, welcome to earth. So, Having a talk with, about emotions and emotional intelligence without bringing up needs is missing a key element. There is a direct correlation between our needs and our emotions. The way I look at it is that all negative emotions, anything on the, the negative darker side of the emotional gray midline, if we look at emotions like bright light love and dark death fear, the very center is the emotional gray midline, no feeling at all. If we feel a little bit, oh, that's negative. If we feel, oh, that's positive, right? So it's, it's quite simple, really, when you just look at it from the midline. The midline helps us. When I learned to balance, like to stand on one foot, we didn't learn to stand right in the center, like I gotta stand on the emotional grave. We learned how far can I reach out? What are the extremes? And then work our way in to where the center point is. So the way I look at it is when we experience something negative, all fear is fear of a need not being met. This is one of those statements that I, I did come up with it. I'm not patting myself on the back or anything, but I'm, I'm just saying there are certain things in life that are just so brilliant. They're so simple. You wonder why no one ever thought of them they encapsulate so much and you think you understand them at first because they make sense, but it takes literally years and years, sometimes decades to what my acting teacher used to say, grow into the material. So um, let me say that again. I do aver myself from my observation and conclusions drawn that all fear is fear of a need not being met. So if you wanna know why you're afraid, look to what need you were afraid wasn't gonna get met and then use your intellect to determine, okay, wait, what are my options? How can I get that need met? 
and then get it met and there's nothing to worry about now you now you're accomplished in harmony you got your needs met you're satisfied all these wonderful things that we want to feel no more i can't get no satisfaction you had your need fulfilled you're satisfied that's what we want problem is every day there are 24 hours to keep going to get the next oh, so now i need something else now I, it's never ending now i need sleep now i need to get up now i need water now i need brush now I, you get the picture so what goldman says here which i love so much this is a great question for us all how can we bring intelligence to our emotions civility to our streets and caring to our communal life simple questions right and you would think being such a social loving creature that'd be the first stuff we'd do right i don't know i don't know maybe so so <laughs> so that's what he brings to, to, to the table. That's what he's brought to the world. His gift to the world in 1995 was to show us that it, emotional intelligence existed, what it was, how to obtain it, et cetera. And here's the thing. I talk about these things and they're so reasonable. Oh, of course, that makes sense, yes. But knowing them in theory and actually employing them in our lives to get ahead of our emotions is what's extremely i cannot impress upon you enough it is extremely difficult to do this to apply emotional intelligence it's not that hard to understand what it is and that's where the trick is you i have been a victim of thinking oh i get it i get it and then not actually applying it because the emotions got ahead of me well, guess what? We've got an uphill climb because this is the way our brain is literally configured. Okay, it grew there. Other animals have much smaller brains. These brains were developing, developing, developing until boom, 1400 cubic centimeters were sending rockets to the moon. Other creatures don't do that. They don't make Coca-Cola, put it in a can, crack it open and drink it. They don't have that. <laughs> so we're, we're a unique species for sure. Okay, but here's the catch. We still operate on biology that started a billion years ago, however many, right? So here's, here's uh, Goldman gets into the, anatomy of the brain a lot, but let me just give you the basic. We have two minds, one that thinks and one that feels, okay? But the fact that the thinking brain grew from the emotional in the brain stem, the original brain, the brain that many other animals have, we just grew more, okay? So the fact that the thinking brain grew out of that emotional one reveals much about our relationship to thought and feeling. There was an emotional brain long before there was a rational one. That's why rationally you understand what I'm saying, but emotionally, can you actually do different story? So here's what we're up against. Our eyes and ears taking information that after passing through the thalamus goes to the amygdala before the neocortex, okay? I'm gonna simplify that, <laughs> give you some, some understanding context there. One is just, okay, light comes in through the eyes, sound waves come in through the ears. Those are wired somewhere, right? Those connect into the brain. So the thalamus is just this, this reception point that gets that info and then it sends it through a tube. This amygdala, that's the, the, what you hear is the reptilian mind, the, the sympathetic nervous system, the one that's fight or flight right? The one that just has this immediate, you recognize danger, boom, sh oh shit. Okay, so the neocortex, neo, new cortex section. So this new area of the brain, again, that we have that other animals don't have, our brains are three times the size of our next closest relative <laughs> in mind capacity. So, so there's that. And the problem is, the catch here is that we can't even get to that thinking, intellectual, rational mind until we've already milliseconds before had the emotional, had, we had the right. So if, if we see an oh shit thing coming, our brain is already in oh shit mode. That's it. He talks long about all the, the, the hands get, if you're in anger, the hands get more blood so you can fight or fly the legs. If you're afraid, the legs get all the blood so you can run away. Oh, this is all built in there. Every animal on earth has some kind of mechanism for, for this reaction. But the catch is we're so smart, 
we can't use that smarts when we're triggered into fear mode because desperation strikes. And as a wise person once said, I don't know whose quote this is, but fear is the mind killer. When we get in that mode, we're not thinking clearly. We're not assessing all of our options. We need to make split decisions, split second decisions. And that's, that's from old, old, old brain stuff. So Goldman talks about emotional intelligence as being a few specific bullet points, we'll call them, okay? He calls it the basic flair for living. Now, if, if we're not a social creature or if we live alone, this isn't the basic flair for living. This is the basic flair for living for us humans because we're ultra social, okay? So the essential human abilities or competencies, as he calls them, are self-awareness. This is, this is huge, insanely huge. In my work, Secret Powers of Love, I talk about holding up the mirror for one another so we can gain self-awareness through the feedback the, the um, helpful, purposeful feedback of one another when we open ourselves to it and welcome it. And that's an important part. I've spent many an hour of my life trying to impose these brilliant ideas on people who weren't ready, didn't want them, didn't ask for them, were stuck in negative emotional states, resisting me all the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exercise in futility, people learn from my mistake. Thank you. Okay, so self-awareness is huge. Who am I being? Am I being helpful or am I being a jerk here? Is my ego in charge and I'm trying to prove what I know? Or am I actually an empathetic, compassionate human who just wants to see better for you, my human family? So that's the question we always get to ask and the balance we get to find. Self-control is the next one. Also, he says, being able to rein in emotional impulse. Well, hello, that's what we're talking about. We can't just go blurting out like Tourette's, the, you know, asshole, <laughs> when, we, when someone has frustrated us. Right? And it takes two to tango. Yes, the person did something that frustrated us. And yes, we reacted. But hello, there's a next step of how we respond. And that's, that's where we employ something that I learned um, up at True North. I was doing a fasting and they, they have psychologists up there who they're focused on addiction and eating disorders and, and how to help people, you know, resist temptations and get over habits and all that stuff. And so she talks, she taught me this, this beautiful concept called response flexibility, self-control. Someone says something, it hits you harshly. Are you automatic in your response or are you flexible enough to hold back that knee jerk response and think, wait, what do I want to tell this person? What do I want to say? What do I want to do here? What do I want for us in this moment? And what should I then communicate to help foster that thing that I'm looking to bring about. So that's self-control. Empathy, reading another's innermost feelings. This, it just, it cannot be understood how valuable that is to be able to read one another and really know, are they getting me? Am I wasting my time? Are they, are they resenting me right now? Should I stop? Is this working? Am I feeling a green light? Should I keep going? <laughs> simple dilemmas that we have if we're not able to really read how we're being received. And then he talks about, here we go, the arts of, the art of listening. And boy, is that an art. And boy, are we not taught that. My first day of acting school, he said, for the next 60 seconds, count the sounds you hear. It's a beautiful exercise. And what a way to start a whole class they say acting is listening, acting is reacting. And to react accurately, you have to listen, really listen and engage what's being done to me right now. That's how I learned to look through the words, get beyond the subtext and into the actual doing and perhaps even the psychological and emotional causation of why that doing was chosen in that moment. And nine, nine, nine times out of 10, it's not chosen. It's just automatic from subconscious mind. So the arts of listening, Resolving conflicts, Whew, what an art that would be if we could uh, get our heads around resolving conflicts the world over. And cooperation, handling relationships smoothly. So if we really used our emotional intelligence, we would examine the relevance of things. We would pick and choose what we wanna judge, what we wanna express an opinion about, what we wanna point out in others. But for my money, if we're gonna get anywhere with emotional intelligence, we need to be open to others holding up a mirror for us so we can receive feedback and have a better understanding of ourselves, our intentions, our motivations, what we're putting out there, what we're actually feeling and what we need so we can employ our brilliant mind 
we can do brain surgery and we can't think to communicate what our needs actually are so we can get them met. Let's engage with one another for support, create unity in our human family and mutually bask in a world where our needs are met. That would be an exercise of our emotional intelligence.